Some of our viewers are certain to remember that at the end of each episode of The Sports Reporters, hosted here on ESPN by my father, Dick Schaap, for 13 years, and then by John Saunders for 15, the panelists and the host would offer up their parting shots. Here on OTL, we will be doing the same every week. At least that's the plan for now. This week, Stephen A. Smith leads off. Thank you. When Kyrie Irving decided to speak to the media a few days ago, highlighting a few glaring needs the Brooklyn Nets may have, something occurred to me. Load management just might not be the NBA's biggest issue after all. Perhaps it's the loads of management some of the game's biggest stars may actually require. Think about this for a second. We've got a Brooklyn Nets star guard making $31.7 million this year, fresh off of missing 26 games already this season due to a bad shoulder, talking about the Nets' glaring needs, even if he and Kevin Durant are on the court healthy together. We've got the $32 million man in Kawhi Leonard missing games to prevent injuries from happening ahead of time. We've got Anthony Davis legitimately too sore to play with a bruised back, but evidently no problem at all boarding a flight to Green Bay for a Packers game, flashing for the cameras along the way. What is this? Perhaps it's all about the titles or just simply doing things their way as opposed to the best way. No one wants to hear a star talking about needs when his dollars may compromise a team's ability to provide them. No one wants to hear about stars who already get at least four months off per year planning on taking more time off on the customer's dime. And if you're too injured to play, how about being too injured to fly? As for those who say, you know what? It's about screwing over the fans, but who cares about optics? Here's a solution for the players. How about you don't take the money? See how that works for you. Odell Beckham Jr. successfully made it all about Odell Beckham Jr. again. On Monday night, we watched the LSU Tigers complete the best season by a college football team in history, led by the best season from a quarterback, Joe Burrow, in college football history. And yet somehow, the LSU alum and the second best receiver on a 6-10 and 10 in the NFL team, Odell Beckham Jr. made it all about him. Celebrating on the field after the game, Beckham peeled off 50s and 100s off a wad of cash and he handed it to LSU players in full view of crowds, reporters, cameras, anyone he could get to look at. He wrestled the megaphone away from the band and he interrupted Coach O's victory speech. Then, in the locker room, he slapped a security guard on the butt for which an arrest warrant for simple battery has now been issued in New Orleans. Now look, I don't think any high crime was committed here and I don't want an NCAA investigation, and I don't think criminal charges are warranted. But from his watch against NFL regulations to his visor against NFL regulations to his shoes against NFL regulations, it's always about Odell. And on the biggest night LSU has had in a decade, his post-game antics managed to steal the shine and make it all about Odell again. Tomorrow, the Chiefs are in the AFC Championship, and I'm looking forward to watching their offense, which is helmed by a man named Eric Bieniemy, who, despite coordinating the most explosive attack in football, did not get an offer to be an NFL head coach. Now, recently, as the ranks of non-white coaches have dwindled, everybody's been looking for explanations other than discrimination. They'll point out that Andy Reid, not Bieniemy, is the Chiefs' primary play caller, as he was with Matt Nagy and Doug Peterson, both of whom became head coaches. They'll argue that teams want guys with quarterback experience. They'll look at the men who are getting jobs and reverse engineer narratives to explain the shifting winds that seem to blow their sails. But really, if they want to understand why diversity isn't rising, they should look below them at places like Minnesota, where the sons of Gary Kubiak and Mike Zimmer are reportedly being considered for both coordinator spots, or Washington, where Norv Turner's son was just hired to run the offense. Now, I'm sure these young coaches are good at their jobs. But their ascension reflects a simple truth. People give opportunities to people who remind them of themselves. They're not always related to them. They're not always undeserving. But they are buoyed by forces more powerful than any football trend. And it's those forces that explain why the NFL's coaches and players look nothing alike. The timing is exquisite or atrocious or uncanny. Here we are having a national debate about cheating in baseball, about how cheating should be punished, about what's acceptable subterfuge and what crosses the line just a few days before we'll find out whether Barry Bonds or Roger Clemens makes the Hall of Fame. For years, they've been getting closer to the threshold for enshrinement. At face value, of course, the resumes would have guaranteed selection on the first ballot many years ago. But they've been punished because they're believed to have benefited from PEDs. 
I have no vote, but you may count me among those less than eager to see them selected. However, and this is a big however, how can they remain out in the cold staring through the picture windows into the museum at Cooperstown when just a few days ago, Commissioner Rob Manfred declined to so much as even scold any players involved in the Astro sign stealing scheme. And let's not even get into the case for Pete Rose or Joe Jackson. Of course, it was Emerson who said that a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds, to which I say, guilty as charged. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For more sports highlights and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.